We have updates in the Manhattan DA prosecution of Donald Trump with a March 2024 state court trial set in the Stormy Daniels hush money cover-up trial. Alvin Bragg's office is fighting back against Trump's efforts to get the case out of state court and Judge Bershon and over to federal court, declaring in his motion for remand that the case should stay put because Trump was not a federal officer nor acting as one when this local business record state law crime was committed. And he can't use the federal officer removal provision to drag his case away from a Manhattan jury and judge. This one KFA and I may disagree on. While at the same time, Karen's old office just made its first disclosure and production of information to Trump's defense team about the evidence against him, including at least one audio tape between Trump and an unnamed witness. I wonder who that could be. Here's a hint. It rhymes with Schmeichel Crowen. And two, we turn to new information that indicates that this may be the last legal AF where we talk about a Jack Smith indictment without having one, at least as it relates to Mar-a-Lago espionage and obstruction case, with new evidence that Trump intentionally and knowingly misled his lawyer at the time, Evan Corcoran, and his sidekick, Christina Bob, about the location of national security and classified documents he was hiding, telling him to only look in the storage room and don't play with or open daddy's desk or office, as Trump gave instructions to his personnel valet to move documents in and out of that room before Corcoran met with the FBI and searched the room to respond to the May subpoena. Missing video clips, boxes packed in an SUV driven thousands of miles to Bedminster, New Jersey, a maintenance worker Trump probably doesn't even know the name of who's cooperating with Jack Smith's team. This case has it all. It's like a bad John le Carré novel. And finally, the other of Jack Smith's at least four grand juries other than Mar-a-Lago is now looking at Trump's public firing of his then head of cybersecurity infrastructure and security agency, Chris Krebs. That's an agency that Trump himself created to focus on foreign interference. That's like having the Fox set up security for the chicken coop because less than two weeks after the election, Krebs declared that the election was secure, there was no fraud or election interference. Smith's team is focused on that and what it may prove about Trump's criminal mind and intent as he clinged to power. This is the midweek edition of Legal AF, only on the Midas Touch Network with your co-anchors, Michael Popak and Karen Friedman Agnifilo, back again to play traffic cop at the intersection of US law and politics. Oh, I'm breathless. Hi, Karen. <laughs> You're good at that. I like your openings. <laughs> Thank you. I, I work on them a little bit. <laughs> How are you? I'm pretty good. Yeah, I'm, you know, good. the official and the unofficial start of summer, right after Memorial Day weekend. And it, you know, interestingly, I was walking around and, and I saw that yesterday was the 21st anniversary of the end of the 9 11 uh, search and recovery. Uh, you know, at the World Trade Center when they when they were trying to collect remains and and um, and all of that, they they stayed for a long time. And yesterday was the 21st anniversary of the official end of that, which I was just surprised. I didn't realize they had uh, they had gone on for so long. So yeah, there was a, a little yeah, memorial. I don't, I don't... Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that. As people probably know, I worked for Cantor Fitzgerald, who lost 658 people on 9-11. And so that 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 tragic event was part of the fiber of that company and was thought about and is thought about every day by the people that work there. Of course, I joined many years after, but it still is something that resonated there. And I'm glad that we never forget and we talk about these kind of hard matters here on legal AF, but let's jump in, right? And let's kick it off with your old office. I like saying your old office, where to remind people, if Karen was in that office still, she'd be running the show against Donald Trump. So listen closely to her insider knowledge because it's based on on some real, real credible uh, experience and professional judgment that was developed. So what do we have? We got two, two ways to talk about the Manhattan DA and update our audience, Karen, on what's going on there. First, we've got Alvin Bragg uh, responding to Donald Trump's attempts to drag the Stormy Daniels hush money cover up 34 count business fraud case out of Judge Mershon in a Manhattan, uh, a Manhattan jury's hands and bring it across the street 
literally across the street, to a federal court in the Southern District of New York. And, and when that's done, just as a little breakout legal AF law school session, the move, the attempted movement or transfer is called removal. You do it with a notice of removal or a filing. The petitioner does that, the party that wants to remove it. You have to have grounds to remove it. Your grounds are really one of three. You either have, you argue that there is a federal question that is involved, meaning something that arises under a statute, a law, or the U.S. Constitution that at the heart of the case that belongs better in federal court, or there is a case or controversy between two people of uh, different states or a foreign country in another state or two foreign countries or two states. And that has to go to federal court under what's called diversity or diversity jurisdiction, depending upon the amount at issue. And then lastly, if you happen to be a federal officer, which I'm not sure anybody believes that the president of the United States at the time was, then there's a special federal officer removal provision that says if you were a federal officer and you were doing something under the color of your position, like within the course and scope of your duties as a federal officer, at the, and you're being sued over that, you get to take that to federal court too, even if it started in state court. And then if you're on the other side and you don't want it to go, you want it to stay where it was and stay put, then you file a motion for remand to have the case remanded back. Now, during that process of this you know, sort of ping pong or shuttlecock between remand and removal, federal court and state court, the case stays in state court. This, even though the federal judge has taken over limited jurisdiction to decide the issue, okay, the case remains where it is until and unless and until it is dragged across successfully by that party into federal court. That's why Judge Mershon is still able to make rulings and decisions and enter protective orders and enter a trial date because the federal judge hasn't taken complete jurisdiction over the case and may not. We'll talk about that next. That's the framework. And then the second part we'll talk about, Karen, is what's going on in the state court proceeding in the meantime, which is the finally, because the protective order is now in place and been read aloud to, to Donald Trump at his fake West Wing Oval Office set at Mar-a-Lago, when he beamed in by video into the hearing a week or so ago, we now have, okay, protective orders in place. Manhattan DA is starting to turn over the discovery that's subject to that protective order, the information that they need to turn over as a prosecutor to a defendant in order for them to defend themselves or know what the case is against them. And one interesting disclosure that was in there that you and I can talk about. Let's go back to remand federal court. And you have a very strong opinion about this. So I'm going to turn it over to you, kind of take it from there. And then as needed, I'll weigh in. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I, my strong opinion is that it's not a, it's not a no brainer to me that this stays in state court. I think there's a legitimate question. And I think the federal judge is going to weigh this strongly about whether or not to remove the jurisdiction or the prosecution of the case from the state court where it is now under Juan Mershon. Uh, and Alvin Bragg is the prosecutor to federal court, which would be in front of a federal judge. And Alvin Bragg would still be the prosecutor. It would just be in federal court. So I, I just think there, there are many people who say, oh, there's no grounds. This will definitely stay in state court. I think I could argue it both ways. And I think we need to be at least paying attention to the possibility that it could go to federal court. And the reason I believe that is uh, for two reasons. Number one, when there was a case involving, um, I can't remember if it was Trump v. v Vance or Vance v. Trump, because um, there were several cases where Cy Vance, the prior Manhattan DA, who was uh, who I worked for, Trying, they were seeking Trump's tax returns while he was president. Um, that was pursuant to a state grand jury subpoena and in a criminal case. And, uh, and it was to a different, it was to his accounting firm, the Mazers firm, not to Trump himself. And because he was sitting president and you can't really uh, sue or, or have any jurisdiction as a, on a sitting president while they're president. And so, um, so Cy Vance, through a grand jury subpoena, sought Trump's tax returns. And that very 
that that should always be handled by a state court judge. It always is a grand jury subpoena. Grand um, state court judges in New York and and elsewhere routinely rule on whether a grand jury subpoena should be um, followed through with or not. And there's mo a motion to quash if somebody doesn't want to do it. But you handle that in state court. And so, and so basically that Trump said should be removed to federal court and made very similar motion practice and arguments. And we all said, this isn't even to Trump, this is to Mazers. How is this even a question that this is, and this is a state court proceeding, et cetera. And the federal court, the federal judges there actually removed the case and brought it to federal court. Now, Cy Vance's office continued to uh, enforce the subpoena in federal court. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Ultimately, they got the tax returns from Mazers, and that's what led to the indictment of the Trump Organization a few months later, um, where you know where where Alvin Bragg. Uh, actually prosecuted the case ultimately, or tried the case, I should say, and they had a 17 count conviction. So that's reason number one why I think it's very possible because this wasn't even regarding Donald Trump, it was regarding his tax returns. And there the federal judge very liberally read the law and said this belongs in federal court and construed it because it was so unique that it was involving um, the tax returns of our president. So, so that's w reason number one why I think it's possible um, that, that they could really stretch the law and read it to say that, um, that it, it should be federal. And the second reason I think is because when you look at what the elements of removal are, there's three requirements for federal office, officer removal under 28 United States Code 1442. Um, number one, the person has to be a federal officer. Number two, uh, they should have to be facing criminal charges for conduct arising under the color of their office. And number three, they identify a colorable federal defense. I think you can make an argument for all three of those. I don't think it's slam dunk in all three of them. And I know that the submission that Alvin Bragg just wrote for remand, the 40 page submission that was just filed, makes a very strong case as to why Trump doesn't meet any of those three, let alone all three. And they also argue that you need all three. It's not enough to have one or two or three of those. Um, and But they, they argue very convincingly that all three don't apply. But I think you can make an argument that all three do apply. So, for example, they say he's not a federal officer um, and, you know, that it typically a federal officer is defined as someone other than an elected president or vice president. Um, but I recall, if you, I'm sure you recall, under the um, E. Jean Carroll case, where it was Carroll versus Trump, you know, that that particular case where where they ruled, this is Carroll one, right, that's still being what that when he made the defamation claim while he was president, uh, the question was, does the Westfall Act apply? And they said he was a federal employee. Now, is a federal employee the same as a federal officer? Probably not. But you could see a federal judge say, you know what? He's number. He's federal. He's federal officer number one, right? They they could say that, and it wouldn't be crazy for a federal judge to rule that. So, but but you know the Manhattan DA's office in this filing is 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 very. Uh, is very cert certain that he's not a federal officer. I think it's it could go either way. Number two, he uh, faces criminal charges for conduct arising under the color of his office. Now, they say in their filing that this had nothing to do with when he was president. It it was all before he was president. And you know, again, I understand that is the case from a timing perspective, but there's two issues that I think have to that that kind of go. Uh, in favor of it potentially being um, going federal, which is number one, he wrote all of the checks to reimburse Michael Cohen while he was president. You know, he was, this isn't, it's not like this all occurred before he was president. And the Manhattan DA's office acknowledged that, number one. But they could say, okay, but it was still private, even though it happened while he was president, it was still his private conduct. But I really think that, you know, when you're president of the United States, that's very much a 24-7 job. And 
there is no doubt, even under the people's theory of this case, this was all about him securing a federal, um, a fe the federal pres the presidency in a federal election. That was the whole point of this, right? So the whole point of this crime was so that he could secure this office and become president. And so I just think that, again, they can make an argument that this entire thing, although yes, it was a fraud perpetrated on the American people, frankly, it was the it had to do with him becoming president so that he could then be president and exercise all of his duties under the color of his office. So I think, again, that's an argument that can be made. And number three, uh, the it identifies a colorable federal defense. I mean, to me, this is the one where they're going to say, look, you know, this was about interfering with a federal election. How is that not a federal crime? And and where there's a federal election crime and a state election crime, they're going to argue preemption, meaning the federal law preempts the state law. And so therefore the state law attempting to commit a crime can't apply because it's preempted. It should be federal. And so again, does it have to be a winning defense? No, it just has to be a colorable federal defense. So to me, if the judge wants to, can say, look, it's very unique to have a president who is uh, being charged with a crime. I don't want to open up the slippery slope of having, you know, the, all states bring charge, all local DAs, you know, can bring charges against a president that they don't like. It's it's politically motivated. Oh, and that the final area that that um, that Trump argues that I also think um, is again somewhat, I can make an argument that is persuasive, is that he says there's something called protective jurisdiction. And, and it's a concept in a federal court that there is no such thing officially, but it has been alluded to in uh, in certain court opinions and in dicta and in, and in concurrence and dissents of other decisions, that it's a concept that exists, that there's a protective jurisdiction of the federal court if, uh, if a state court a prosecution is politically motivated. So basically what 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 um, the Manhattan DA says is if there is such a um, protective jurisdiction, even though we don't think it there is, he doesn't meet those elements either because there's nothing here that that says this is politically motivated. And, and Judge Marchand, you know, although Trump constantly says he's hostile towards him, I don't think that, you know, there's no evidence as such and et cetera, et cetera. And, and then the final just one thing I'll say about their submission is they say, even if any of these things apply, Trump's motion papers, his his submission, his notice uh, failed to specify any of these elements, essentially saying his lawyers suck and don't do a good job and don't uh, put the necessary things in, you know, out there that are needed to to find any of these. But I don't know. I just think I, I look at all of this. This was a the first time a, a, pre, a former president of the United States has ever been uh, has ever been um, you know indicted criminally, and it was while he was president. And I, I just think that for those reasons, the fact that some of this happened while he was in the Oval Office, it could you know it could there could be witnesses that you know worked for the president that have to be called, et cetera. I, I don't know. I just think here. I think it could go either way, and and we'll see what the, what the federal judge does. But what do you, I want to hear your your thoughts, Pope? Mark. Yeah, I, I I agree with Alvin's position. I, I don't. His first argument for the Manhattan DA's office is this particular individual is not even a federal officer, so he doesn't get to use the federal officer removal statute because there's case law and a, an analysis under other federal statutes that even though the president is considered, as I like to joke, employee badge number one as an employee of the federal government doesn't mean he's an officer, a federal officer, as those terms are used in statutes, including in this one, not in the Constitution, but in a federal statute regarding the jurisdiction of a court, in this case, the federal court, which has at its essence, limited jurisdiction. So I like the argument that he is not, as the president of the United States, as slightly 
counterintuitive as it may sound, that he's not a federal officer as that term of art is used in the statute. Their fallback argument is even if he was a federal officer, he was doing nothing more than garden variety businessman Donald Trump at the time that he was doing the cover up, the hush money and the repayment of the hush money. Whatever happened while he was in the Oval Office certainly wasn't part colorable colorable part of his official functions as the president of the United States. It was a private affair, no pun intended, a private contract, a private agreement between him and Stormy Daniels through through the lawyers and the payments as such. And, and then I love the fact, Karen, that in the brief itself, they used tweets from Donald Trump at the time, back when he was on Twitter, at 6.58 in the morning, 6.59 in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning on the same day saying, this is a private agreement, a private contract, a private uh, a thing between me and Stormy Daniels and the, and the non-disclosure agreement. Yes, we agree. This is their point. We agree with Donald Trump's own words that this was not Donald Trump qua president of the United States. It was Donald Trump running Trump organization and hiding the affair from his wife and the, and the American public. So I think he fails on those. I also don't think, and I agree with Alvin Bragg, that they have, that this arises out of, feder- at its essence, at its core, what we call the gravamen, right, in our business, of the, of the case is a run-of-the-mill garden variety state case of crime, business crime, as you once said on the podcast, charged every day in every way successfully by the, by the Manhattan DA and other DAs. This is local crime. And there is a body of law on the federal side that says that federal courts should stay out of lo- what is and, 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 and not interfere with what is state local police power and municipal power. So that's argument number two. And on the defense, I really don't see it. We already know that the executive privilege has been stripped away from him. I don't know of any other immunity or 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 a uniquely federal defense to what as what is at essence state claims. The the federal election claims that are being used in the thirty four count indictment, yes, they're being used to ratchet up and give the the double the double crime requirement to get it to be a felony but they are uncharged. They're not a charged set of federal crimes. They are a charged set of state crimes where there is an uncharged underlying crime, which I believe can stay uncharged throughout the entire time. And so they're not they're not preempted. I know they're going to make that argument at some point. So I think he fails, boom, 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 not a federal officer, certainly not a federal officer uh, performing a federal presidential function when he's doing the cover up or even the repayment to Michael Cohen and and certainly doesn't have a unique federal defense. And he's got to have all three. He's got to run the table. He's got to have all three in order to have federal jurisdiction. Otherwise, federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction. They shut the door, lock it to people if they can't satisfy this jurisdictional thing. And he can't argue that he's not going to get a fair shake because, you know, his his, his other organization uh, the Trump organization has already been tried in state court successfully, successfully for the state, uh, been prosecuted and convicted. Um, there is a place for him to get justice. He just doesn't like, and let me just remind everybody that people might be thinking, why is he doing this? Why is Donald Trump doing this? Is it for delay? Not really, because federal courts, first of all, when they pick up cases that are criminal cases that are already in 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 uh, in the in the mix, in the flow, they, you know, Hellerstein doesn't have a lot. He's a senior status judge. He doesn't have a lot on his plate. He can set a trial that matches the trial date that Judge Mershon set and make it for March of 2024 as well. Um, and, and then you just pick up some federal rules. But this is state. This just to remind everybody, and Karen, you mentioned it earlier, state prosecutors going to stay. The state claims, state law violations are going to stay. These are not going to be converted by fit of alchemy into federal crimes, okay, to allow for a future federal pardon by a president named Donald Trump or otherwise. These are state claims with a state prosecutor. The only thing that's different, it's going to be the judge in the courthouse. Everything else, the rules, uh, the rules of evidence, I think will probably change to federal, but that's not a big thing. So why? People think, why is he doing this? Other than just to be contrarian, He's, he's probably doing it because he doesn't like the jury pool. You and I have talked at length about when you're in Manhattan, which he just was for the 17-count conviction, 
the jury pool is pulled from everybody that lives in Manhattan. And for those that don't live in and around this area, when we say Manhattan, we don't mean New York City. We mean the borough of New York, Manhattan, just the city, top to bottom, right? You know, upper Harlem, lower <laughs> down to down to the battery or whatever it is. That's it. And that trends liberal, blue, Biden. If you go to federal court, even though it's just across the street because it's a different system, federal system, it pulls from a broader a voter a, a, a broader base for the jurors, including counties. I think there's eight or ten of them: Orange County, Putnam County, Westchester. Some of them went Trump. Some, most of them didn't. But he was competitive in some of those counties. So Trump, I believe, is hoping to God that out of his nine or twelve people on the jury, and the, and Alvin Bragg's got to run the table and get all nine or all twelve votes beyond a reasonable doubt, that he picks up one or two or three Trumpers country club Republicans, whatever, that hold out and find reasonable doubt. That that to me, and I want to hear your opinion, why is he doing this? Why is Trump doing this? Look, I think that's definitely part of it. I think he, I think there's, I think it's delay and he fights everything, right? That's his MO. He wants to just cause chaos and cause havoc and delay things. And so I do think that's part of it. I think he's judge shopping. I think he's hoping to get a better judge. He doesn't care for Juan Rashan, to say the least. I think he's also just trying to, you know, mess with Alvin Bragg and force them to be answering these, you know, wh while they're running around answering these arguments and going back and forth to federal court, I'm sure in his mind, he thinks then they can't be continuing their investigation, their other investigations that they have into me, you know, the the financial, the, the the one about the valuation of assets. He's also, you know, hoping, as you said, for a better jury and, and a better judge, right? Like those are the things he wants. He he just, he doesn't like what he has. And so he just looks for a way to, to disrupt, delay and, um, yeah. and get something different. That's what yeah. I think. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's, I think it's a combination of both those things. Let's, before we leave this segment, let's touch briefly on the, now the protective order is in place by Judge Mershon. Remember, we're staying in state court unless and until it is sucked across the street into federal court. And Judge Mershon is setting trial dates and entering protective orders. And the Manhattan DA is now ready to turn over these different categories of information, some of which pursuant to the protective order, Trump can only look at with his lawyers in the room. They have to babysit him because they, nobody trusts Donald Trump. Some can be shown to, to him without his lawyers. I think it's a very small group. And now is the opportunity, and I, and I want you to take it from here, Karen, with your experience, where they filed what, what is referred to as the automatic discovery form, listing broadly, really broadly, the evidence that they have for the 34 count uh, business record fraud case against Donald Trump. Um, and then without mentioning names, saying, and one of them is a recording and probably other recordings between the defendant and another unnamed witness, which means <coughs> Michael Cohen. Um, <laughs> and we played Michael Cohen's clip a number of times on Hot Takes and Legal AF. Walk the audience through, because they really like this part, I think, your experience about what just happened why does the prosecute, let's start at the basics. Why does the prosecution have to turn over this material? And why do they have to do it so soon? Why can't they sandbag the defendant at trial and whip out witnesses and documents and evidence? Wouldn't that be better for justice? And you can talk about why they have to do that. And what is being accomplished now? What does the reference to this kind of audio or video or electronic evidence mean? And when can we expect to hear about, if ever, more disclosures being com coming out of the Manhattan DA's office to the uh, defendant. Karen yeah. Friedman, Agnifilo. <laughs> so there's something uh, in the law called discovery, and that occurs in both criminal and civil cases. In civil cases, uh, discovery is much more mutual. You have to turn over, you ask for things and you have to turn over things, you ask questions, you have to answer them, and you even get to do things called take depositions and interview people. But in criminal law, every state is has has its own criminal discovery statutes and it governs the timing of what gets turned over, the content of what gets gets turned over, and just how all of that works. And, and 
for a, there are there are certain states that have in criminal cases very liberal discovery meaning or, or they call it open file discovery where you have to give everything and there are certain states and I, I i think florida might be one of them where in criminal cases you even get to the defendant gets to depose or 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 interview or take testimony from the victim in the case prior to you know or the witnesses in the case prior to uh, the trial. New York was one of the states up until recently that had one of the most restrictive or conservative discovery statutes that people complained about and the defense bar complained about because uh, they felt that it was sandbag justice or you know this, this sort of where, where things didn't have to be turned over, believe it or not, witness statements didn't have to be turned over to the defense until after the jury is sworn at trial and right before the but and before the person testifies and so you know there was a lot of hide the ball uh, prosecution happening and that's you know and look ninety eight percent of cases don't go to trial and so part of it is just for economy sake right if if you prosecute a hundred thousand cases a year and ninety eight thousand of them don't go to trial you don't have to collect all that discovery and gather it and photocopy it and then categorize it and turn it over and redact it for sensitive, you know, information, et cetera. And so you'd only have to do it for the 2000 cases that go to trial, which is much more manageable. Well, the defense bar, um, had, uh, had lobbied the, um, New York state government for a very long time saying it's just not fair and it's not the way things are done anymore. And across the country, in fact, most jurisdictions allow for much more discovery. You know, there's wrongful, we know now that so many people are wrongfully prosecuted because most people who are prosecuted are people of color. This isn't fair. It's racist. You know, all, all of the persuasive arguments that changed the law in 2019. Uh, so I think it was January 1st, 2020 is when the discovery laws changed. And don't forget what else happened two months later, we went into a global pandemic. So the New York state uh, criminal justice system went into kind of havoc at that time, because now you're turning over discovery in all 100,000 cases. And, um, and you know, all of New York state had a challenge to try to now you have to gather all that information in every single case and you have to turn it over fairly quickly. Uh, the law, you know, it says 15 days from arraignment, but it gives you an extension of another 30 days if it's a complicated case. So, but so within 45 days, you have to gather everything, literally everything. And, and it doesn't sound like that's very much, but in today's cases, that is enormous. Okay. It's every email, it's every text message, every phone recording, every video, every piece of electronic evidence that you could possibly get with digital, you know, fingerprints that people leave behind everywhere they go. You know, they go to a hotel, you've got a card reader, you know, that goes when, when you do your, um, your, your, uh, hotel key, you know, or whatever, or the video going in, if the crime, you know, whatever it is, there's the, their Metro card, your, you know, your credit card records, whatever it is, you know, and in white collar cases like this one, it's even more. So you have millions of documents. You have, you have terabytes of documents, uh, that, that have to be turned over. And just the mere gathering of that and to have to turn that over to the defense is just an enormous task. And it's really, I, I would say prosecutors are saying that it is uh, game changing and the hardest part of their job now where it was not even really an issue before. You also have witness safety and privacy concerns. You have to redact it. You have to go through it all yourself and you have to redact anything that you're supposed to redact when it comes to someone. And I'll tell you, you know, now that I'm a defense attorney, I recently tried a case where, you know, on, on this side of the aisle, I love open file discovery because, you know, you get the whole case. There's no secrets anymore. I can't imagine preparing for a defense and trying a case as a defense attorney without having the grand jury testimony and all of the, uh, all of the, the evidence that the prosecution has. And frankly, it's the more fair thing. I, I, it surprises me that we did things this way for so long. Uh, it's so much more fair this way. I mean, there shouldn't be any secrets. You should be able to win um, a case based on the merits of the case, not by playing some games and playing hide the ball with your with your evidence. So that's discovery primer 101. So this is a case 
where you have millions of pages of documents and uh, and they had to prepare to turn it over and they had to give it over to to um, the Trump team. This case, though, there's a protective order, as you said, which means Trump doesn't just get it because they're afraid he'll abuse it and and frankly hurt the hurt the case by trying it in the in the court of public opinion as opposed to just court. And so there's a protective order saying you're allowed to look at it, but you're not allowed to tweet about it or truth about it or whatever his, you know, fake Twitter account is called. Uh, you're not allowed to, you know, you, you're, you're allowed to use it only to prepare for your defense and you're only allowed to look at this stuff with uh, your lawyers. And so the way that gets turned over is with a discovery, I guess they call it an automatic discovery uh, form, but it's really just a list of the documents that are, that are getting turned over. And here we saw there was a recording and it's a recording that we think is a recording that Michael Cohen made of conversation with Trump about this payment. I think that's fairly significant and I think that's gonna be a very powerful piece of evidence. Did I answer your question, Popak? I think so, but why is it, why is it <clears throat> significant? Why is that significant from a prosecutor's standpoint? Because it's it's the words of the defendant, right? If he, you, you don't get to depose him in a criminal case, you don't even get to, talk to him or get his statements unless he testifies. And we don't know if he'll testify or not in this case, but here the jury will get to hear his own words, his own voice, his own planning of the crime, his commission of the crime. You know, that's a very powerful, it, it takes away some arguments depending on what it says, right? Or what he says, can he say he didn't know or he didn't plan it or he wasn't involved or what it was about. It's very much a window into his mind, into his brain, into his words at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, also look, one, one other thing about the recording, just to remind people that it is legal in New York to record somebody with only one person's consent. So if you and I are having a conversation, I can record you without you knowing, or you can record me without knowing, putting aside ethical issues because we're lawyers. If we weren't lawyers, there'd be no issue whatsoever. Uh, but you know, we are a one party consent state. There are other states in the US that are two party consent states where you cannot do that. You can't record a conversation with someone unless both people agree. So you can't surreptitiously record someone, but New York is a one party consent state. So there's nothing wrong with Michael Cohen recording those, those statements and keeping them. Thank, thank God he did. And then just a final wrap up and then we'll move on into our show today. The reason that there was a payment to Stormy Daniels that came through Michael Cohen, and this is the reporting and investigative reporting about testimony that's been given by David Pecker, the National Enquirer publisher, disgraced publisher, who participated in the catch and kill, devised the catch and kill program to catch people and stories that claim that Donald Trump had had affairs and sexual relationships with people outside of his marriage um, and paid them off, said they were, he was buying the stories for the National Enquirer, but all he was doing was, was paying off these people, making them enter into forced, compelled non-disclosure agreements, NDAs, and then never publishing the stories. That was the catch and the kill. And that people were involved in that decision-making, Donald Trump, Kellyanne Conway, Michael Cohen, Alan Weisselberg, and the like. The reason that, that because the first test case before Stormy Daniels was Susan McDougall, who was a former Playboy playmate, who was paid $150,000 directly from David Pecker on behalf of Donald Trump. And she entered into an NDA, which she later tried to get out from under, and the whole cat got out of the bag related to that one. Then Stormy Daniels and her $130,000 payment, that one was made by Michael Cohen on behalf of Donald Trump, because David Pecker testified that he got screwed by Trump and didn't get repaid. And so he wasn't going to do it again for um, Stormy Daniels, which is why it went, instead of going Pecker to um, the person, it went Michael Cohen to the person's lawyer, Michael Cohen having to get reimbursed by Donald Trump through a series of payments and bonuses under this false entry in the books and records, hence the 34 counts of legal retainer, legal services rendered, and that type of thing, when it was really just a repayment of the hush money. 
We're going to talk about um, two really uh, big, huge bombshell. We keep using that word, but it's really true. Developments in the Mar-a-Lago Jack Smith investigation and prosecution with a with the lead lawyer, now former ex lawyer, testifying that he was misled by Donald Trump and others when he did his search that led to the thirty four the now infamous 34 documents shoved into an envelope instead of the 100 or more that were being still hidden by Donald Trump next door in his office. That's Evan Corcoran. And then we're going to talk about why Jack Smith is interested in the firing of Chris Krebs, the head of the cybersecurity um, and infrastructure uh, um, Homeland Security D Department that looked at fraud and said there was none during the election. What does that say about Donald Trump's mens rea? But we're going to do both of those after a word from our sponsor. Did you know that the best tasting honey on the planet comes from New Zealand? It's called Manuka honey. Manukura has absolutely mastered the art of beekeeping. Their super honey is always 100% raw and has a rich and creamy texture that's unlike anything you've ever tried before. It's a super honey because of its unique antioxidants and prebiotics, as well as a natural antibacterial compound called MGO that only comes from the nectar of this tea tree. I tried the 850 MGO rated Manakura honey from the bottle and wow, it was better than I could have ever imagined. Not to mention that it contains nutrients that support optimal immune and digestive health. Every batch is 100% traceable with a unique QR code on every jar. You can verify potency and purity. You can even learn about these beekeeper that harvested your honey. I had my honey straight from the spoon and it was delicious by itself, but you can also add it to tea or coffee, pancakes, yogurt, salad dressing, ice cream, whatever you like. The creamy caramel texture melts in your mouth and it's unlike anything I've ever tried. Manakura. It's savory, it's delicious, and truly the best honey I've ever had in my life. Manakura's honey is available in a range of easy-to-use formats, including squeeze bottles and compostable honey sticks, so you can eat it straight or add to your favorite foods and drinks. If you head to manakura.com slash legalaf or use code legalaf, you'll automatically get a free pack of honey sticks with your order, a $15 value. That's M-A-N-U-K-O-R-A dot com slash legalaf or use code legalaf to get a free pack of compostable honey sticks with your order. You haven't tasted or seen honey like this before, so indulge and try some honey with superpowers with Manakura. And I love Manakura. I just tell it salty offline. I am drinking it right now. You put a squeeze bottle, a little dab at the bottom, you do a little hot water to activate it, hit it with some cold water, ice cube, and lemon. And, you know, for those that think, uh, you know, my voice sounds ragged some days, it's because I'm not using Manakura honey with my water. I am today. That's great. <laughs> a little side bonus for Manakura. We like them as a sponsor. So let's um, let's move on. Uh, to Evan Corcoran. We've talked a lot about Evan Corcoran. He quit as a lawyer four months ago for Donald Trump. We know that he got stripped of his attorney-client privilege, or Donald Trump did, because it's the client that holds the privilege, because then Chief Judge Beryl Howell of the D.C. Circuit Court ruled in a secret hearing about the secret grand jury proceedings by a presentation by the prosecutors that there was likely a crime or fraud perpetuated, committed by Donald Trump himself in the way he handled or mishandled these documents after he left the White House and how he interacted with the National Archives, how he interacted with the FBI and the Department of Justice. And having found this crime fraud exception, she stripped Evan Corcoran of all of his attorney-client protection or, or Donald Trump of it, forced Evan Corcoran to testify to the grand jury about every deep, dark, secret, and private conversation he had with Donald Trump. And for good measure, this was the one that was a real head-scratcher at the time because we, we heard about the, the fact that he had had to turn over all of his attorney notes, which like sent a shudder down the spine of any practicing lawyer like you and me, I was like, oh my God, my notes, which are privileged generally, have to be turned over to the other side, the prosecutor. Oh boy. And Evan Corcoran apparently took really copious notes about Donald Trump's facial expression and reactions and and things that were said to him or not said to him and interference with his job as a lawyer by Walt Nauda, the personal valet for Donald Trump and Donald Trump himself. We heard about the docs, but not about what was in them. And then we heard about the testimony, but we didn't quite know what it was. But now, every day, it seems, 
there are strategic leaks coming out of the prosecutor's office at the very end of Mar-a-Lago about evidence that they have. And I want to talk to you as a former prosecutor about why you think we're hearing about these things and what does it mean for the case or they're squeezing certain witnesses. On, on, on Evan Corcoran, Evan Corcoran will apparently testify that he was misled by Donald Trump and those around him about the location of that national security material and classified material that Donald Trump was hiding and storing against law you know, as a crime at Mar-a-Lago. He was told emphatically, and Donald Trump never did anything to disabuse him of this thought, that all, all of the White House material were in a storage unit at Mar-a-Lago, which is where he, Evan Corcoran and Christina Bob, did their quote unquote diligent search, which is what they certified under penalty of perjury when they signed on that form and handed it to the Department of Justice. What Evan Corcoran now knows and has told his closest confidants and the government is that Donald Trump had other documents in his desk and in his office that, that Evan Corcoran was told was off limits to him. Now, I don't know how, as a practicing lawyer, under the ethics rules, you would allow your client to mislead you. If I'm doing, and I've done searches for documents at a client in discovery, and if a client said, yeah, yeah, don't go to that locked door, that's exactly where I want to go. Don't, don't look in that filing cabinet. There's nothing there. I want to go confirm that. Don't go play in daddy's desk and go look in daddy's, daddy's uh, drawers. That's exactly where I want to go. But Evan Corcoran, like many of the lawyers around Donald Trump, took Donald Trump at his word for some reason and just said, oh, okay, everything's in the storage unit. This is my artist rendering of Evan Corcoran. Okay, I'll just stay in there. And then Walt Nauta, the personal valet for Donald Trump, who apparently still works for Donald Trump, um, tried to sit in on the review session. These are like classified, top secret <laughs> materials. And Evan Corcoran said, no, no, I, I got it. I don't need you in here. What Evan Corcoran did not know, but we now know from other reporting and other leaks, strategic leaks by the prosecutor, is that there is video evidence of Walt Nauda moving in and out and taking boxes in and out of that storage unit just before the June 2nd meeting arranged between Evan Corcoran and the FBI, Jay Bratt, the head of counterintelligence, to turn over what Evan Corcoran led the government to believe was the entirety of the um, purloined documents, 34 shoved in a, in a taped sealed manila envelope with a certification by Christina Bob. What a coward Evan Corcoran had Christina Bob sign it um, and say under penalty of perjury that this is what they found under a diligent search when they knew or should have known that the locked door next door and in the desk drawer, there were at least a hundred other pieces of material that should have been turned over. They have the video. They subpoenaed it from the Trump organization. They see Walt Nauda. They see the date. But then there's gaps, and they're trying to figure out if there's criminality between the erasure or the failure of the videotape to pick up other key moments. They also see, and they have cooperating testimony from a maintenance worker at um, Mar-a-Lago because Jack Smith rightly believes that it's the maintenance workers, the housekeepers, the kitchen staff, you know, the silent worker who sees everything. And they brought in, for instance, a housekeeper for two deep briefings and interviews, a maintenance worker who now is his own criminal defense lawyer, who's cooperating closely with them. He helped Walt now to move the boxes, not only in and out of the storage unit, uh, the storage room before June 2nd, but moved them out to an SU, a waiting SUV packed to go 1,500 miles north to Bedminster Golf Course. And the, and the government, as of right now, doesn't know what's in those boxes. So we could see another search warrant up at Bedminster because they've never been returned. And I don't think the, the government has any confidence in the information they're getting out of Walt Nauta because they think really he's lying to them and he won't cooperate further, so the reporting is, unless he gets immunity. And then he'll turn it over. Meantime, a maintenance worker is turning over photographs of this is the, here's the storage room. Here were the boxes that I moved. I want you from, that's, that's the data points. That's the facts. I want you from a prosecutor to tell our audience why Jack Smith is interested in this and how do you make your case or the elements of a crime based on this new information? Why the focus? So Evan, 
So Corcoran is clearly suspicious of Trump from the jump, right? And and so the fact that he took such detailed notes about every little thing in facial expression, in his mind, he's saying, one day, this is, I'm going to be, it's going to be me versus him. I'm not sure I trust him. And so I want to make sure my notes are crystal clear. He also, as you said, didn't want to sign that uh, that affirmation. And he had Christina Bob do it. He and, and she added that little bit, you know, I was told or to the best of my knowledge. Again, he clearly had his suspicions when they said, no, don't look here, look there. So he's doing he he from the beginning, you can tell he is not one of these completely, you know, Trump all the way, I'm going to be loyal to you to the end. And, you know, I'll, I'll do your bidding for you and with you. He clearly had some kind of a suspicion or, or skepticism. I'm not saying he's a national hero by any means either. But I'm saying there was there was a little bit of I'm going to think of myself, not just of Trump, you know, I'm going to look out for for myself here. And so I think that's why it's very clear that Jack Smith is interested in him because he was a lawyer for Trump. So therefore, Trump would have spoken to him, hoping, thinking that he had uh, attorney client privilege, right? So he might have information uh, that that would be normally you would not get. But here you get it because it's the crime fraud exception, number one. Number two, Evan Corcoran was the one who can say, who did what when with respect to these documents? And, you know, don't forget lots of other people had had documents, right? That's his defense. Biden had them, Pence had them, everybody had them. What makes it a crime isn't having class, classified documents because that's not even the crime, right? It doesn't matter if they're classified or declassified. Don't forget, this is under the Espionage Act, which just requires that it be national security material. It doesn't have to be uh, material that is classified, top secret, any of that. It doesn't have to be anything. It's just involving national security. Uh, that's the that's the crime that they're looking at. The other crime they're looking at is obstruction of justice. So, okay, we know you have it, but are you holding on to it when you're not allowed to have it? And so that goes to state of mind, and it's very fact specific. Some of this stuff, and Evan Corcoran can can give those elements of the crime that are so spe fact specific. And that's why Jack Smith is interested in him. If it was just a matter of possessing classified documents, right? That <clears throat> you don't need any witnesses for. It's you either have them or you don't. But that's not at all the elements of the crime uh, that he's being uh, investigated for. Again, it's whether or not this is national security material and what was the purpose for him having them. So for example, there were certain material, there were certain uh, documents that they had that that he had that Trump had that related to various countries, right? Uh, China, Turkey, you know, um, I can't remember some of the others, you know, Middle Eastern countries. Yeah. And, you know, and it was it was there were and it's going to be looked at was this were these records were they were these ones that were places places where Trump was doing business and that he was going to you know look to buy property or he had property or he was having business dealings and he's going to use these materials these national security materials to his own benefit Th those are the types of things that they're looking at and and Evan Corcoran is going to be able to talk talk about that along with you know Tim Parlator. Uh, they're going to be able to provide that information to Jack Smith and and turn this from a just straight possession case. And then and and so if if Trump declassifies these things in his mind, you know, which he's not allowed to do or can't do, it, again, it, under this crime, under this statute, it doesn't, none of that matters. He could have, you know, mentally declassified them, you know, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter because it involves national security. So I think that that's why, why, um, you know, these witnesses, including, um, you know, uh, Calamari, you know, his, um, his calamari junior and senior you know who who have been long term uh close you know close advisors uh to trump are all of interest to jack smith because they can talk about the 
was this a deliberate attempt to obstruct justice and affect national security? Or was this just an accident that everyone does it? And, you know, we packed up quickly and left. And it's these little breadcrumbs. It's this kind of information that is going to help Jack Smith build this case, right? He's going to be able to talk about uh, the fact that, you know, that, that as you pointed out, this maintenance worker, you know, who had a photo right before and then right after the the meeting and the date, you know, the metadata that will be in that photograph about the timestamp and the date stamp and the location of that of that photograph will really help kind of talk about how this was a deliberate attempt to evade the FBI, right? You move boxes the day before they get there and then you move them back after they leave. I mean, that's, you know, right there, consciousness of guilt 101. And, you know, you've got, you, you've got certain, you know, people who are going to be able to provide those various el elements, you know, the calamaris, you know, who, um, are going to be able to talk about the security and the and the video of Mar-a-Lago, and again whether or not that was an accidentally deleted or deliberately doctored, or you know the housekeepers, you know who who have been interviewed, the kitchen staff who've been interviewed, you know all of them are going to be able to to put the pieces together to build this case and tell the story about what went on, and uh, you know and. Um, and who did what? I think you're gonna. I think in addition to Trump, we're gonna see Boris Epstein, Boris Epstein uh, also potentially as a defendant. You know, he was very much someone involved in this. You know, interference with the records at both Mar-a-Lago and then at Bedminster. Um, and you know, the, the the FBI has Epstein's cell phone. And again, he's somebody who will do whatever it takes and say whatever it takes. You know, there is no line that that he, Giuliani, and and certain others are aren't willing to cross for Trump. You know, at least Evan Corcoran has his own, you know, personal he he's gonna save himself. You know, Alan Weisselberg so far hasn't been willing to save himself for you know, he'll go down, you know, for for Trump. And I think Epstein and Giuliani are are two other people in that similar boat. So, you know, the, those are, I think those are the reasons why um, this is so interesting, you know, to, to Jack Smith so that he can, he can prove the elements necessary uh, for, for the national security espionage case and the obstruction of justice case. Yeah. I think they're going to do this case with or without Walt Nauta, but they're pressuring Walt Nauta hard to testify against Donald Trump so hard that the reporting is that Walt Nauta's lawyer won't go forward with continuing to talk to the prosecutors who have already made it clear they don't think that Walt Nauta has been honest and truthful with them um, unless he gets an immunity deal. And then I guess he would spill, spill the beans about what Donald Trump, his client, because he was the personal valet. What is that, by the way? What is a personal valet? I mean, it's, other, it's, the, other, old, it's, the, old, it's the old phrase that, that they used to use in the White House for the butler. I was going to um, say, other than Downton Abbey, you yeah. know, like they used to a call, it was worse. They used to call it the butler. I mean, everybody that's seen, you know, the movie, the butler understands what was going on in the White House um, and who served in those roles, you know, from, uh, you know, not great standpoint. It was usually African-American gentlemen and women that served as, as housekeepers and butlers in the White House for white presidents, white male presidents. And uh, that, they converted that politically incorrect term into valet at some point. And then now it's like it's like an assistant. It's like a real exclusive. It's, it's always with the president. Sometimes they call it the body man. I think they, are, they because the person carries like on his body everything. You know, nasal spray, hair dye, orange tanning, self tanning lotion, whatever. And he gets this after when he leaves. You get to keep uh, your valet. No, but he 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 pays for it himself. I mean, the government we don't pay for it, uh -huh. but he has a he, yeah he has a guy. <laughs> And the guy's name is Walt Nauta. And if Walt Nauta doesn't play ball, he's going to end up being prosecuted along with Donald Trump um, in all things related to Mar-a-Lago. It's, we'll it's amazing just what people of a different, you know, socioeconomic stature, you know. <laughs> What's the matter? You don't, you don't have a body, man? <laughs> I don't have a valet. <laughs> you don't have a valet? No, the only good, my, that's, that's closest I come is when I valet park my car, you know, every <laughs> once in a while, which I can't even remember the last time I did that either. But anyway, sorry. So, so let's that's okay. Let's move on to our final segment today, which is to talk about the uh, what at the time was a, a watershed moment in what we all thought was the corruption of Donald Trump, which is which is that he fired his head of cybersecurity infrastructure security agency, 
with the ungangly name of CISA, which was a department under the Department of Homeland Security that Donald Trump invented. And Chris Krebs was pictured there. He, um, he was the first head of CISA. Um, I'm not even sure who the, if there is a current head of CISA, but he was certainly the first head. He was the inaugural person uh, in the job and by all accounts was a man, a person of integrity, a per, one Department of Homeland Security person upon hearing about his, his unceremonious firing after he got opposite Donald Trump about the safety and security of the election, said there is no finer public servant that I've ever worked for or more competent person or talented person than Chris Krebs. He was very highly respected, almost apolitical um, in his position, which I'm sure rubbed Donald Trump the wrong way. A person who looked for loyalty tests at every place he could get it. Who can forget the conversation he had with the then FBI director Comey, where he looked for a blood oath loyalty commitment from Comey back to him as a loyalist. I'm not understanding the position or the, the role of the Department of Justice. And so um, Chris Krebs was fired nine days after the election because he had the temerity of announcing in a tweet, as the CISA head, to assure the American public that this November 3rd election, just nine days earlier, was the most secure in American history. Right now, across the country, election officials are reviewing and double checking the entire election process prior to finalizing the results. And that was his declaration on the, on the 12th. Well, Donald Trump didn't like that. And later on the same day, Donald Trump fired Krebs. He said, the re and I'll read this aloud for those that don't watch us on YouTube, the recent statement by Chris Krebs on the security of the 2020 election was highly inaccurate in that there were massive improprieties and fraud, including dead people voting, poll watchers not allowed into polling locations, glitches in the voting machines, which changed, do we have more of that? Votes from Trump to Biden, late voting, and many more. Therefore, effective immediately, Chris Krebs has been terminated as director of CISA. And Chris Krebs fired back with a one-line tweet that said, honored to serve, we did it right, defend today, secure typo tomorrow, hashtag protect 2020. Chris Krebs was right. Donald Trump was wrong. Donald Trump was wrong about everything on November the 12th that he listed there. He was told he was wrong by his advisors. He was told he was wrong about all those items by outside um, consultants, two sets of them that he hired and paid for over a million dollars. He was told he was wrong by um, lawyers within the White House and White House counsel about every one of those things, yet he fired Chris Krebs for doing his job and saying what was true. At the same time, as a split screen of democracy, as we continue to be the conscience of democracy, at the same time Chris Krebs was saying that, on Fox, over at Fox News, Sidney Powell and Michael Flynn was telling the American people that they're, and I'm not making this up. I know when people think I go into some of this stuff, Popak's got to be making this up. I am not making this up. They told the American people that there was a secret supercomputer a secret supercomputer that was flipping votes from Biden to Trump. This is what they told the American people, against which Chris Krebs had to respond about all of these things. And he said, point blank, we've looked into all of these things. They're either unsubstantiated or highly dubious or technically impossible. And that's the end of it. My imprimatur is on this as the head of CISA. This is the job I was hired to do and without politics or favor, and this is what I'm doing. Now, why does it matter? Because, oh, and here's here's a great quote. Thanks for reminding me, Salty. Then you had Joe De DiGenova, another lawyer for Donald Trump, no longer with him, that went on um, uh, Newsmax and said the next day that Chris Krebs should be taken out at dawn and shot and drawn and quartered for defending the election. Chris Krebs then sued Donald Trump and Joe Dianova, DiGenova for defamation, and he got an apology, a complete retraction and apology from Joe. I don't know what happened to the case. It was hard to find what happened to that case, and Chris has moved on to a consultancy that bears his name. But now we have reporting that Chris, uh, Chris Krebs firing and the aides that were involved in that decision-making around Donald Trump have now 
caught the interest of one Jack Smith, who has subpoenaed those aides to come in and talk to him to find out what Donald Trump knew and when he knew it. Why did he write that tweet? Why did he fire Chris Krebs on, on, on the opposite of evidence and no evidence at all? And how does that go to the state of mind, intent and knowingness of Donald Trump to convict him of a crime? What do you think from a prosecutor standpoint, Karen? What do you think if this evidence is borne out? Where do you think Chris, uh, where do you think Jack Smith is going with it? So, you know, there was a lot of post election uh, fishiness, criminal activity, et cetera, that Trump engaged in, uh, including, don't forget, removing Bill Barr, right? Uh, after the, after he lost the election, he, um, you know, he told Trump was trying to get Bill Barr to do his bidding and look into, uh, you know, Georgia and, you know, all the election, state election fraud, all his theories uh, that he had decided, you know, were happening. And Bill Barr refused to allow the DOJ to engage in that. And in fact, stopped allowing uh, Trump, uh, you know, a certain Trump loyalist, um, her name was Heidi Stirrup, um, to, you know, be able to, she was supposed to be the White House liaison between the White House and the Department of Justice. They stopped letting her in after, you know, she was, she was basically banned from the DOJ uh, after the 2020 election because she was trying to get sensitive information from the DOJ officials, you know, while she was hunting for this election fraud. And, you know, Trump was trying to use the Department of Justice you know, inappropriately. So he, you know, don't forget, he, Barr resigns um, and, um, and then he puts Jeffrey Rosen in after the fact and then wants to take Jeffrey Rosen out and put Jeff, Jeffrey Clark in, which he didn't do, thankfully, uh, but he wanted to, you know, there was all this post election, you know, these people should be lame ducks helping the transition, right? There shouldn't be new appointments or new, you know, positions. There should be acting people. I mean, it's it's crazy what he was doing after the election. And Krebs, I think, is exhibit A of his criminal intent, essentially, of both what he knew and then what he was trying to do. He, this is, you know, as you said, Chris Krebs' entire job was about cybersecurity. And he comes out and he says, look, this is the most secure election in the history of, you know, elections. There's no evidence that any voting system was deleted or, or I'm sorry, that they deleted or lost any votes or changed votes in any way that it was compromised. You know, like, you know, the, that he was very clear, right, that, that, you know, the integrity of the election was not compromised. And, you know, that he was doing his job. He was calling it like he saw it and Trump fired him. And, you know, it's, it's, I think it goes to the fact that he knew about it. And he also um, goes to the fact of what he was trying to do. It goes to his intent. Again, remember if Trump just genuinely believed that he lost the election, it's a very different case than if he knew he had lost the election and didn't care and tried to overthrow the government. I mean, you know, it's a totally, it's, it's a difference between this being, you know, committing a crime and making a mistake. And I think Krebs is, um, is important because it goes to, like I said, what he knows, but it also goes to what his mindset was. It was, you're disloyal because you're not going to do what I say, even if it's a lie. And so you're going to be fired. And I, I think it's powerful information. Yeah. I agree with you. I think Chris Krebs um, getting before the grand jury uh, and testifying and having his day before the grand jury to tell a story about, and I think he would be a great witness in front of the grand jury, um, just as they had brought in election experts, uh, Fa uh, Fawny Willis in Georgia, to teach the special purpose grand jury and the future grand jury about election law and how elections work and how technology works and how voting works. And that was really helpful to the special purpose grand jury to fit within that framework, all the evidence that they were hearing to make them sort of, you know, um, uh, fast experts on this issue, which they have to be in terms of um, uh, being the trier of fact, going through and sort of sifting through all the evidence. Here, I mean, the grand jury hearing, being able to hear from Chris Krebs, who's considered to be one of the leading experts on cybersecurity and, and, the, and the security and sanctity of an election process and technology related to that. And he'll look them in the eye and said, there was no hacking. 
There was no vote flipping. There was no secret supercomputer that operated by the deep state to flip votes. There was no fraud that would have overcome the outcome of the election. There's always some voter fraud. I mean, there's, there's no, you know, there's always some dead person voting. There's always somebody that votes in the wrong district or precinct. There's always somebody that tries to vote for their mom, you know, uh, dead or alive. Um, and that gets caught and sometimes that gets prosecuted. So it's not that, it's just against a hundred million votes or whatever our, whatever our vote count, 50 or 80 million votes. It just does, it's not enough to overcome the overwhelming, um, or the overwhelming um, amount of votes in battleground states. You'd have to have uh, court. You'd have to have the thing that that everybody, Sidney Powell, Giuliani, and others claimed that there was, which was massive voter conspiracy among state voting officials, voting workers, uh, software manufacturers, hardware manufacturers to flip millions of votes from Biden to Trump. I mean, it just, it's just, the fact that I'm even saying it, no reasonable person could ever believe this. And that's why the case against Donald Trump is so strong, because even if he says, you know, um, no, I really did believe it. it. It's not, if you use a reasonable pur purpose, reasonable person standard, which we'll talk in another podcast about the Supreme Court trying to move away from re reasonable person standards, there's no reasonable person that would ever believe that any of that was true. Um, and so Donald Trump's not going to be able to get away with that. And then Chris Krebs would look the grand jury in the eye and teach them what they need to know about the lack of election fraud. And then they'd match that up against all the facts about despite that, despite 70 lawsuits Donald Trump lost in and around the country, despite being told by his own consultant consulting firms that he paid a couple of million dollars for two separate ones besides being told by the cyber ninjas hired by the Arizona Republicans that there was no fraud being told by federal judges and state judges that there was no fraud to overcome the will of the people you can't bury your head in the sand and we call it in the law willful blindness and say i don't care i believe i won the presidency it doesn't matter it's like him continuing to say I don't care. I was not a sexual abuser of E. Jean Carroll. Well, a jury of your peers through a through a process, just like if a court announced it, announced that you are, and so you don't get to say that you're not any longer. You can say I disagree with the jury's finding, but you can't say that it didn't happen. And and uh, that's his problem. And, and every time we hear about these what I call strategic leaks, because remember for the longest time, we, it was a lot of you and I talking, like speculating about, well, what do you think Chris Corcoran said when he went into the grand jury? Hey, Karen, what do you think, you know, this lawyer or that lawyer said when they were stripped of attorney client privilege and had to testify? But now, but now it's getting leaked because I imagine the prosecutor wants to put ultimate pressure and pain on, on people like Walt Nauta and other witnesses to come clean to get on this freight train or they're going to get run over or as i heard one legal commentator say that you know that, that he's just lining up the nails in front of the hammer and if you're not going to get on board with jack smith he's going to hammer you and i think that's why we're hearing more and more about it and that's why donald trump's freaking out by sending this ridiculous letter on jim roland and and jim trustees uh, a letterhead, thank you, Salty, um, to um, to Merrick Garland, the wrong person, saying, uh, you know, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Why don't you investigate Hunter Biden more? Oh, pretty please, can we have a meeting? Uh, I mean, that's just, it was silly. I would have been embarrassed as a lawyer to send that letter. Um, and it really also demonstrates that it seems that there is not anyone on the Trump side of the ledger that has any credibility or ability to pick up the phone and call his friendly neighborhood prosecutor and arrange a private meeting to try to resolve something. I had thought wrongly, and I'll admit I was wrong, as I say on my Twitter profile, co-anchor of the almost never wrong legal AF. <laughs> I, I was wrong. I thought Jim Trusty, who was once a colleague and a friend of Jack Smith would be the one, if there was one lawyer in the bunch, in the gaggle of lawyers, I don't know what you call a group of lawyers like this one, I'll call them a gaggle, in the gaggle of lawyers representing Donald Trump, if there was one that would be able to use his prior relationship to Donald Trump's advantage to try to get a meeting, 
as every other criminal defendant tries to do at some point, it'd be Jim Trusty. But Jim Trusty's busy writing these ridiculously dictated letters from Donald Trump instead of picking up the phone and calling Jack Smith. And this world is a small world. Before we leave and we're ending the podcast, Karen, talk about two other colleagues that you know well and how they're related to Donald Trump. We'll throw up a picture of that one. <laughs> who's that? Yeah. Who's that? Yeah. So you've got on the left that's highlighted uh, in white, uh, you know, amongst the yellow. That's yep. Jack. That's Jack Smith. And on the right is Judge Mershon. And they were colleagues at the, that's the class of 1994 at the Manhattan DA's office. And there's always a class picture. I was the class of 1992. And uh, <laughs> so they they were in the same class, which and, I thought was really, you know. I, and, I, and I know that you've been talking to, you've been talking to us about that for a while. You thought, I think they're in the same class. <laughs> Not just that they were, we were all Manhattan DAs together, yeah. which you were as an illustrious group at the time headed by, uh, well, were you there for Morgenthau? Was that side? Yeah. It was Morgenthau. No, that was Morgenthau. Yeah. Robert yeah, Morgenthau, was- for those that don't know, the original model for the, uh, for the district attorney on all things law and order was modeled after Robert Morgenthau. And then Cy Vance and now Alvin Bragg, all elected, all elected by the citizens of Manhattan because they choose who they want their prosecutor to be. And that's what they did. And that's a great photo. And it just shows you how if Donald Trump and Republicans and MAGA and lawyers all have some sort of incestuous overlapping history, so do the prosecutors and the judges. And I'm sure that keeps Donald Trump uh, up at night. It doesn't mean that Juan Rashawn's doing anything wrong. In fact, we think quite the opposite. And certainly everything we've heard about Jack Smith since he left that office is that if anything, he's the most apolitical. Even even Jim Trusty in interviews has said that, that uh, Jack Smith's always been apolitical. He's not somebody that's going after somebody. And that's why he was chosen by Merrick Garland. Um, f- for this particular thing. But Donald Trump doesn't care about these things. Donald Trump continues to attack judges. He continues to attack prosecutors and their families because he thinks the judges are not going to fire back, which he's probably right, because they are above it and they need to act like they're above it. So he's going to get a lot of political hay out of bashing Judge Hellerstein, when Judge, if Judge Hellerstein rules against them on the removal of the case to federal court, he's getting a lot of hay with his constituency and money by attacking Judge Kaplan and the E. Jean Carroll case. I mean, I, I, I've, this is like so beyond what I've ever experienced with a client attacking the judiciary, because that's not gonna lead them to give you good orders that are in your favor. But this is what Donald Trump does, and this is what you and I follow every week um, on the Legal Mid- legal AF Midweek Edition with Karen Friedman, Nick Niffalo, and Michael Popak. We do it again, and we collect and curate other stories for the Saturday edition with Ben Micellis and me. And then we do hot takes throughout the day, throughout the week. When you add them up, it's like hundreds and hundreds of hot takes on this intersection of U.S. law and politics. And then people often ask, yeah, we have sponsors. Yes, because somebody asked me, why do we have sponsors? Because because Midas Touch Network has like eight podcasts and does hundreds of videos a day. And, you know, listen, we're not socialists. <laughs> you know, uh, people that help us with this show have to get kind of have to get paid. They're not volunteering their time. They're making this their career. Um, and so that's why. And the other way is most of the ways that you can support us are completely free. Um, and it really helps. I can't overemphasize how much what I'm about to lay out as a blueprint if you want to help us as an audience. And if you stuck with us already for an hour and 10 minutes, you obviously like what we're doing. And this is how you can help us. You can give thumbs up here, literally a thumbs up on the YouTube. If you're listening, if you're watching it on YouTube and you can leave a comment, Karen and I read the comments. We've been known to open a dialogue with you off the comments, if that's important. And it helps, it helps the show and the content and have it come to you that way. We drop this a video as an audio podcast, a traditional audio podcast, about five o'clock in the morning Eastern time. You can get it everywhere you get your podcast. In some places I hadn't even thought you can get your podcast from, but you can get it from Google and Spotify and Apple. You can get it from uh, iHeartRadio and you can have Alexa. If you have Alexa, you can say Midas Touch Legal AF and it will pop up the new episode, all sorts of fun things there. So you can go listen and subscribe, which sounds like it costs money, but it doesn't. It's a plus sign. It's a follow. It's free, but it helps us stay atop the ratings and helps this content come to you 
uninterrupted and, and at the quality that you're looking for. And uh, and if you're a watcher, listen. If you're a listener, watch. And then we got a merch store, one that we're refreshing with new material. Not quite ready yet, but we do have long sleeve t-shirts, short sleeve t-shirts, and coffee mugs, and other Midas Touch materials in store.midastouch.com. And you can be, you can sign up, and if you want to pay a little bit of cash, you can give it to through a Patreon to support the overall network. And you can join us in chat. We're always there in chat. We try to always be present and respond. The chat goes fast during the show. So if we don't get to your comment, don't don't be disheartened. I promise we'll get to you. You can reach out to us. People have. You can do it on social media. Uh, Karen and I are both there. She's at KFA Legal. That's easy. I'm at MS Popak. We're both on Twitter and we're active there. You can find us there. And that's it, man. That's how you can support Legal AF and what we do. And um, we're always looking for ways for us to improve. You don't know the amount of time that Karen and I and Ben and and Salty and the rest of the production staff spend in just trying to get it right and just talking through the stories. Um, we're texting each other throughout the day. We're getting on phone calls. Did you see this? Did you see that? Can you follow up on this? Can you grab that? Um, you know, we're trying not to do it by the seat of our backsides and the seat of our pants. And hopefully you're... You uh, you think you think you think that you think that we're not doing it by the seat of our pants and last minute because because we're not but we're so pleased to have you here legal AFers and the Midas Mighty and always the last word for the show goes to Karen Friedman Agnifilo. Have I ever told you my Jack Smith story? No, but I want to hear it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Jack, so I was prosecuting a case uh, many many years ago. And it was the case was a guy, a taxi driver goes to get gas and puts the gas pump into his gas tank. And while he's standing there pumping the gas, a defendant jumps into the car. He left the car on and the keys of the ignition and takes off. And he ends up doing a high speed chase around Manhattan, which is very long and very big. And he hits a bunch of cars. He's the police are chasing him and he ends up in a head on collision with a police car. And two police officers are injured. One has broken ribs. And, and the guy, I ended up prosecuting the case and the guy had eight different uh, felony convictions from eight different states. He was a career criminal and he refused to get fingerprinted. And he was, um, he even attacked the police officers in arraignments. I mean, he was just a very violent, terrible guy. Anyway, fast forward to the fact that he is going to trial. And he was so difficult at trial that he ends up getting thrown out of court um, by the judge because he kept disrupting the jury. He even fired his lawyer, so he was pro se. So there was nobody cross-examining witnesses. It was the craziest thing. The case um, gets, he lo very long story short, I by the time this case does go to trial for the second time for various reasons, um, I was heavily pregnant with twins and he started threatening me and I couldn't try the case. I mean, number one, I was you know, high risk pregnancy. So this was in 1996, 97. And, you know, it was also he was threatening me, right? It was very uncomfortable, um, to say the least. So 1996, 97, a second year um, ADA, very nice, very kind of up and coming, earnest, well meaning, you know, very busy, had lots and lots of cases, saw that I needed help and steps in and says, I'll take the case and try it for you. And who was that? It was Jack Smith. And Jack Smith ends up trying the case. And it was during that trial where the defendant, you know, attacked his lawyer and so and and his lawyer, you know, fired his lawyer, attacked his lawyer, um, tried to attack the jury. That's why the judge, you know, sent him out. He was disruptive and he was very, very difficult and violent. And Jack Smith took the case, he tried it, and he got a conviction. And it was upheld on appeal, despite the fact that there was nobody cross-examining witnesses because the defendant is the one who caused all of that. Anyway, it's just, I, I forgot that that was that that Jack Smith did that, you know, years ago, but it just really goes to show what a good guy he is. And that was a really serious case. And so for a second year to be able to get that case and try it successfully with a defendant like that, it also shows how much 
uh, faith people, the supervisors had in young Jack Smith to give him such a serious yeah. case at such an early time. But again, it just shows you what a good guy he is. That was a, I, that was a difficult case. It was a, you know, annoying yeah. case. You're getting threatened and whatever. And he just stepped in and said, I'll do it, you know, and volunteered. And, and, and it always stuck with me what a good guy he is. So that's Tiger, my point. Tiger doesn't change his stripes. Leopard doesn't change his spots. <laughs> I mean, you are who you are. I mean, I like to think, and I'm sure you do too, that the essence of who I am as a 50 something year old lawyer was there when I was a 25 year old lawyer. You know, the person is the yeah. person, you know, character is not what you do when everybody's watching character is what you do when nobody's looking yeah. and nobody was looking. He didn't have to knock on your door. He didn't have yeah. to offer to do that. And he would have been just as highly acclaimed at the office and success. Yeah. But look, look at the impression that he made on you. Um, and that's the type, I mean, I don't know what's higher than an Eagle Scout in life, but this guy is like in every report I've ever seen, except through MAGA, um, he's just he, ju he has just led an exemplary life in public yeah. service as a prosecutor. He could have made a lot of money doing other things with his brain and his legal prowess. And he's time and time again, he's chosen to live on a government salary and go to Kosovo and prosecute war criminals and, you know, and go after, you think it's popular and, you know, maybe not his household. You think, you know, he didn't, this wasn't a big major family and political, not political career decision and personal family decision for Jack Smith to go after and be the special counsel written in the history books against the former president. It is. And, you know, that, you know, there's plenty of people that revolved, revolving door their way out frequently to go get several million dollar a year jobs heading up the white collar department, the white collar crime department of major, um, major law firms. And that's not Jack Smith. And he should be given tremendous uh, credit and kudos for that. And he would in any other society and not one where, you know, we have to constantly fight off the... Um, the, the jet propeller, the buzzsaw of whatever MAGA feels like talking about on a given day. And that's what you and I and Ben and the brothers and Midas Touch Network try to do. I heard a really great phrase. I'm going to keep using it because I like it, which is the federal judges in the District of Columbia have become the conscience of democracy in the way they're handling the Jan 6 cases from the grand jury and the chief judges related to that, to the line judges that are handing out and, and are trying the cases of the Jan 6 um, defendants and handing out their sentences. And in our own small way, not to compare ourselves to that, we try to be the conscience of democracy in what we do every day that's why I get behind another microphone at another moment to do another hot take or jump on and prepare for a podcast with you. I know you do the exact same thing. You know, we're practicing lawyers. We have other lives, but we're committed to being here because if we don't do it, we don't witness this in real time as it happens, then we've seated, we've seated it over to the other side and they will fill that vacuum and that void as we have seen with misinformation, anti-American rhetoric, anti-democracy rhetoric, and we can't let it happen again, never again. And I think that's one of our mantras here on Legal AF. And we appreciate, because otherwise it's just Karen and me and me and Ben and Karen talking to each other. And if we don't have an audience, we don't have you committed to being here, investing your time, taking away what you learn, and using it in your life and in your relationships, however you see fit, you, you, you can just keep it to yourself and make you and make yourself feel better. I've had people write me and say, you make me, you and the group, Karen and Ben, make me feel better. My anxiety is lower because of what I learned on Legal AF. And that's good. Some people say I use it over the dinner table with my right wing Republican fill in the blank. And that's good too. Or I use it in the street in a conversation with my coworkers. I was just in one yesterday. <clears throat> with a, I was um, I was at a car dealership, <laughs> and I was just with a guy. The finance director was a Republican, but he was a moderate, and I was able to have a conversation with him. And we had a a, a wholesome conversation, the way I used to have, with because you know we we get caught up in the MAGA world. Thirty percent of Donald Trump supporters are going to support him come hell or high water. They'll only vote for him. It's always Trump for 30% of the Republican Party, and that's not going to change. And that's why he likely wins the primary. But there's the, the hearts and minds of the other 70% of Republicans, right? 
that are still out there that aren't MAGA, right? That that may may or may not vote for Trump, but they're not MAGA, and we can't give up on them. And I don't want them giving up on me because they think every Democrat's a socialist. Okay, nothing wrong with Democratic socialists, but I'm not one. And and you know we have a lot of different a lot of different colors in the crayon box in the Democratic Party uh, in every way, shape, and form, including political political things. Um, and you know, they, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this. They did a really good map in the Guardian, an interesting chart of where people fit socially and fiscally. And a lot of people like to say, well, I'm socially liberal, but I'm fiscally conservative, so I'll vote Republican. And the actual group of voters that fit into that category is very, very small. It's almost a unicorn. People say it all the time, but when they vote, that's not really where they're voting. What they are is the opposite. They're fiscally liberal. Bring on, bring on the free money. Bring on the stimulus. Bring on Social Security. Bring on health care. Bring on roads and bridges and infrastructure and all that. That's liberally, uh, social, socially liberal um, or fiscally liberal, sorry, but socially tight as a drum conservative, right? At which, uh, which, which is what the Republicans, ex- the MAGA Republicans and others exploit. Um, and so we try to bring it all. I don't expect everybody on this podcast to fit I- ideologically exactly where I'm at on the spectrum. I don't. But we try to make it a place of safety and, and wholesomeness for Democrats of, and independents and others. You know, we have Republicans listen to this show to feel like this is a welcoming tent for them when we make our presentations of what's happening at the intersection of law and politics. We're going to do it again next week with Karen Freeman Ignifolo. I'm going to shout out to the legal AFers and to the Midas Mighty. Good night, everybody. Mm-hmm.